let's see, where's, okay. So we're recording now live to Facebook. Bear with us, everyone. Thank you for your patience. Could have predicted this. Um, okay, we are about to live stream. Uh, I think we should just go ahead and dive in here, Ross. Yeah? Yeah. Let's All right, it. man. How's it going? It's going very well. How are you doing, Finn? I'm, I'm doing great, you know, learning about technology, one application at a time. <laughs> of course, yeah. Um, so let's, let's, start, uh, let's start at the beginning. I know you're from Texas, but maybe you can give me a little bit of background as to uh, where specifically you're from and how you got into your music. Yeah, so I grew up in Fort Worth, Texas, which is the, uh, the better side of the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. Um, Fort Worth is really uh, randomly kind of this, this hot spot for, for fiddlers, particularly Western swing players and, and Texas contest style fiddle players. And um, growing up in a city where the, there's an abundance of, uh, of that music, uh, it's kind of inevitable that at some point in time you're going to cross paths with, with a hot player or two. And it just happened that my grandfather, uh, who was a doctor in Fort Worth, um, his real passion and, and love was uh, was the fiddle. And he, my, I have a younger sister, Katie, who's three years younger than I. And uh, he got her started on the fiddle when she was um, five. And uh, about a, a year into her studies, into her practice, um, I walked into her bedroom one day and picked it up. And after sort of watching her play and watching my grandfather play, I was like, I think I can do this. And uh, picked up her fiddle. And uh, I think the first tune I played might have been Faded Love or Boil the Cabbage or something like that. And uh, I remember my, grand, my grandfather and my mom walking in the room thinking it was my sister going, Katie, you sound so great. And they realized it was me standing there playing. And <laughs> within like two or three days, I was borrowing an instrument from a friend and started out with uh, some, some basic fiddle tunes and some basic lessons with some folks in town. And um, wow. the rest is history. I, I, it, was, it was an easier thing for me to do than it was to walk. Sure. Um, and you know, for each of us, we, we find at some point, hopefully we find those things in our lives that, um, that drive us and inspire us and, and really capture our interests. Um, I didn't realize that, you know, looking back eight, uh, nine year old me, uh, was unaware that it was going to be the path of my life, but it was just an easy thing. So I, um, a relatively easy thing for me. And so I, I uh, chased it and, and here we are today in, in uh, 2020 after, um, I guess, 27 years of playing now, God. <laughs> really? Wow. You certainly make it look easy, that's for sure. Well, um, you're too kind. So did you start with Western Swing or uh, take me through your, your first musical influences? Yeah, so um, our, our grandfather uh, had been following this, this uh, relatively unknown fiddle player, a guy named Mark O'Connor, uh, <laughs> since he was, uh, yeah, you might have heard of him. Um, since, uh, since Mark was a teenager coming to Texas for Texas Fiddle Contest. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, when Mark would come to town, before we had even started playing, when he would come to town, um, my, my folks and grandfather would take us to go see him perform. And uh, because he covered so many genres of music, I, and because we grew up in a home where our folks listened to classical and jazz and Western swing and kind of all, of, all of the genres, um, we were exposed to many different musical outlets. And, uh, I don't think it was on purpose that um, Katie and I both, my sister Katie and I both started playing the Texas contest style um, mm -hmm. uh, genre as our first, but because it's so prominent in Texas, that's where we both began uh, with, with right. Texas contest style fiddle playing. Um, we were fortunate, the neighborhood that we grew up in, uh, to this day there remains a, uh, see he still lives there, a famous violinist and conductor named Kurt Springer. and. Uh, we studied uh, under him for a few years, not so much to become classical violinists, but to develop a bit of the skills from sight reading and the, the technical prowess and dexterity and fluidity around the neck, um, which wasn't taught in the fiddling world. It was, you know, very rote and just hold the fiddle as it's comfortable for you. And, you know, you're probably going to play in first position and maybe third position. Um, but once we studied a little bit of, of the classical violin world, it just for me, it 
opened up the instrument and all the things that I had been hearing in my head and been wanting to execute on the instrument that I hadn't been able to do because of the limitations of how I was taught with Texas context style fiddling suddenly became available to my hands. Um, and it's just like everything, like the full color spectrum became wow. the thing. So um, did you, from that moment, did you start to get interested in other genres because now you have like maybe more technical ability to play these other genres? That's exactly right. That's exactly what happened. Um, because I had much more control over my, my left hand and shifting and accuracy with intonation. And I had far more control over different bowing techniques and uh, just, just the feel of the stick. Um, I was able to go from like Texas contest playing, uh, which is very longbow oriented, like bluegrass music, uh, to uh, like Celtic music, which is much shorter bow strokes, quicker. It's totally different articulation. Even how a lot of players hold the bow is far different than, you know, grabbing it by the frog. The Celtic yeah. players, as you know, choke up. Um, so it just, it opened up the possibilities of playing in other genres because I was able to replicate what I was hearing on record or seeing live. Mm -hmm. um, and that that was really probably the the most critical um point early on as a player was uh harnessing that well i guess focusing on on the uh the the complete power that comes with having control over your instrument because then it allows you to uh explore those other genres and man you know uh for for all of us that play you know to just get stuck in one lane playing one genre is yeah. um there are those masters who do that thing but now in this age i really I don't know a single player who doesn't play multiple genres. You, you almost have to, to survive yeah. these days, you know? Yeah, I understand. So, well, that, um, I'm sure a lot of people that are going to watch this um, are fiddlers themselves and maybe dabble yeah. in other genres. And one thing that I hear that comes up a lot is uh, the question of, I, of musical identity. I'm mm. um, playing all these different genres. You know, you, Ross, you have this Texas contest background and you said you've got classical as well. How do you think of yourselves? Do you... Do you think of yourself as being uh, more speaking with a specific vocabulary from a specific genre or when you play Celtic, are you thinking like Celtic musician or how do you navigate these different genres? That's a really great question, man. Uh, you're putting me on the spot here. Um, <laughs> I, th I think that for me, um, I earlier uh, in my career, when I was, when I was still uh, a, a teenager and kind of stepping into my early twenties, um, I really, I was really intentional about investing time uh, focusing on tone and accuracy um, because I did have an interest in all of these genres. Um, I, I wanted to at least, when I had the opportunity to step into these genres and, and play different music uh, that I wasn't necessarily familiar with, I wanted to at least have a command over my instrument at a certain point. So that being said, um, once I really started to explore uh, like Eastern European music and Indian music, uh, not, not just the big American genres that we think of like bluegrass and jazz and Cajun music, yeah. but really world music genres. Uh, that's when I felt um, myself sort of emerging into the player that I have become. Um, but it was never my intent to um, copy, other, copy other musicians, maybe, maybe lift ideas in the spirit of so-and-so. Right, right. um, th they're, so many incredible musicians out there, not just violinists, but musicians on all instruments who, who invest their time in transcribing solos of you know, Charlie Parker or Martin Hayes or Kaylan Kaur or any of these prominent musicians in their specific genres. Um, I just, I had too much ADD and couldn't lock down and, and <laughs> invest the time into yeah. uh, learning solos verbatim, but I would listen to the spirit of what a player was saying uh, in their voice and try to take a bit of that spice, if you will, and add it into my own recipe. And it's really um, helped solidify, uh, and, and, and did a long time ago, help solidify my own voices, uh, a, a singular thing to me. Uh, when I was a kid, I remember this lesson that I had with, um, we were talking about Johnny Gimbel before yeah. we started this. Um, he had a fiddle camp down in Texas, and I had a private lesson with him at one of these camps. And I had learned uh, like verbatim, uh, his solo uh, on his tune um, Fiddling Around off of the Texas Fiddle Collection album and I had learned it note for note like down figured out his bowings like his articulations were so spot on and I played this 
thing for him. And he said, man, you sound just like me. But if you spend all your time trying to sound like me, who's going to sound like you someday? Mm -hmm. And I, I was 12. And that's still like, it's never left my mind, that thought. And that was really when I stopped uh, diving into the, to the deep detail of, of other players uh, and rather invested my time into learning how to become a chameleon and, and yeah. blend into the different genres while still maintaining the, the core sound of who I am. Yeah. Well, wow, it takes time. It really does. Like, absolutely. it takes time, you know. Well, as um, that makes me think of a similar experience that I had once with a jazz pianist. I've studied jazz for many, many years. And um, I, I, I was like transcribing Charlie Parker and all these musicians too. And so um, I, played a, I played a solo for him. It was some jazz standard, like, there will never be another you. And then after it, so it's a lesson, right? I was like, so, you know, any advice? And he's like, you don't have a sound yet, but you will. And I don't say that to most musicians. And what, what he was saying was like, I was basically just copying everyone else's licks, you know, and because that's what I thought jazz was, was to just transcribe other people and reproduce it. Um, and it was like the best compliment I, <laughs> I forgot in some ways. Um, I, I don't know if I have that sound yet, but the point is, is finding your own voice. I think that's such a part of being a musician. Uh, or at least it, for my journey, it's been important to me. One thing that you said that I wanted to touch on, you said when you were learning, you were so uh, obsessed with like accuracy and intonation. And, um, and that made me think of something, about, something else about your playing, which I just love. And it's, it's a word that comes to mind when I think of your playing, which is fearless. Mm. There's something about your playing, like the fact that this new, this new single of yours, Overture, that you recorded in one take, you know, like I could never do that. Like that is so intimidating to me. Just 15 <laughs> minutes, press record 15 minutes and that's what's going on Spotify. You know, yeah. like that's fearless, man. Um, so maybe you can touch a little bit about like, uh, just, you know, that aspect of your playing and like approaching a solo or, or even a recording project without fear and just like playing you. Well, that's, yeah. Well, thank you very much. That's, that's a big compliment. I, um, one of the things that's really helped uh, my, my confidence level with uh, sort of tackling these solo recordings, like the last album that came out, Not Very Good at Winning, was the same as Overture, solo and unaccompanied. Um, it, it's been the, uh, just the, the, the deep amount of time I've, I've put into uh, not only recording sessions here in Nashville for, man, 15 years now, um, and, and being deeply invested in, in that community of, of players. But, uh, but just really being intentional about setting up time to either uh, record on my own here at home or spend time in uh, other people's studios when, when it's wide open. I had this really special experience uh, in 2012 in the middle of my uh, Mumford years. Um, we were living here in, in Nashville and uh, had been renting a spot and then our middle kid came along and, and Sarah went back to Texas for a time and I was living in England. And when we kind of came back to Nashville, we were hunting a spot and wound up meeting a, a, a country artist, yeah, Big Kenny from the band Big and Rich. And they, they had that song, Save a Horse, Ride a Cowboy. Anyway, so random. But he has this, bi this big, beautiful house uh, in, over in Green Hills um, here in Nashville and a, a gigantic, like 7,000 square foot home studio behind the house. And we wound up staying for a couple of days and writing some music with Kenny. And that became a week, which became a month, which became like nine or 10 months over the course of 2012, living at their place. And every single day that I wasn't on tour or away with Mumford, I was out in that recording studio. And there were sessions that we would do, um, but most of the time, uh, I, I kind of had free reign with because Kenny toured and was gone all the time as well. Um, he had a, a full-time engineer and a bunch of interns there working in the studio. So I was very, very lucky and fortunate to basically have this studio to go create, uh, but more than anything, like practice my abilities on microphone because it is an entirely different animal uh, recording um, recording uh, music uh, 
not, not only in like an isolation booth, but just in, in a studio when you're used to performing live, it's a different thing. Um, and it's, it's, it's its own art form. And so for me, I, um, I, I think with these recordings that I've put out, um, it just happened that they, they wound up being solo and, and unaccompanied, but I, I, I attribute my, the, the confidence that I had going in to record these from the fact that it's, uh, for every minute that of recorded material I've put out, I've probably spent 10 hours learning how to improve just my, my abilities for that one minute of time. Um, yeah. yeah. And that's, that's, um, I'm not saying that to scare musicians away from, from going in the studio and recording, but it's, it's really intimidating unless you do it often. Like when you listen to yourself back in the control room yeah. and, and, and you're, uh, hearing every detail of your instrument, every scratch, every note that's a bit pitchy. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's just, it's scary. Uh, but if you're, if you're critical with yourself and you, and you praise the moments that you nail, but you also accept the moments that you totally jacked up and you invest your time and focus into making sure that uh, those spots don't happen again. The more you do that, the, the quicker your uh, confidence level is built uh, in, in the recording studio. And that's what kind of yeah. happened with, with Overture. I went in, I thought it was going to be, uh, I mean, I literally had 30 minutes to record a 15 minute piece. And I was going in with the spirit of it being just a reference recording so that I could continue to whittle away and refine the ideas. I didn't know that uh, I was just going to drill it like I did. I, I sort of caught lightning in a bottle with that one. And it certainly doesn't happen every time, but, um, but that, that's kind of what happened with that particular track. And after mm -hmm. sitting on it for a while, I'm sort of going, I guess I should put this out. This feels like the thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're glad you did. Uh, <laughs> that that reminds me of another thing that I want to ask you, which I'm sure a lot of fiddlers watching will be curious to know. This yeah. idea of getting better and, you know, you mentioned for every, for every minute of recording, there's probably 10 hours invested into improving that minute, yeah. you know. Um, maybe talk to us a little bit about how you, because you, know, you, you have three kids, you have all these projects. Um, how do you manage your practice time so that you're being the most efficient in your practice? And how would you advise others to do so? Well. It's a bit exceptional these days because of COVID era. Um, and now with this ab abundance of time available, uh, it's a bit of an uphill battle to, to find uh, and, and allow the inner creative self to, to uh, come out, to be exposed once again. When you're in the routine of having sessions and you're in the routine of traveling and the routine of performing, uh, that flow itself kind of keeps the, 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 the gears rolling with, with creativity. But now with all this dead time, I've, I personally have found it very difficult um, in waves to, to be creative and to allow that energy to, to come forth. Um, where, I've, where I've found uh, a bit of, of a reprieve from, from the frustration has been just getting out my instrument and not worrying about um, playing mind-bendingly complex stuff. The last few weeks for me, ironically, as I put out this uh, very like heavy piece overture, um, my practice time here at home has like seriously just been like playing the simplest melodies and really just getting inside my violin for tone, like thinking about tone and how to how I can shape the tone and and my fingers. It's um, it's just like golfers, man. When they when they're not playing tournament rounds, you know, I've seen these. YouTube videos of the Tiger Woods and Phil Mickelson and they, they spend hours like practicing the same little chip shot so that they so that they know confidently that they can control how their shot is in moments of deep pressure and because the pressure doesn't exist right now because we're not outperforming and we're not in the studio recording that uh, to keep that energy up because that really does cause in you know a wave of energy to flow yeah. through your fingers uh I have found that uh, practicing like the reverse instead of playing complex, heady stuff in my own living room for my plants and my dog, uh, I, I have been really focused on the, the simplicity of, of melody, of pure tone and accurate finger placement. And man, it has really uh, reignited um, 
that creative spark that has kind of disappeared in, wow. in waves during this time. Uh, and that, that would be a thing I would recommend to, to any player who's kind of up against the wall right now uh, in, these, in these days to just like sit with your instrument and don't play to impress yourself or anybody else. Just like really be critical about how your down bow feels, how your up bow feels, how the, the synergy between mind and heart and hand yeah. is just um, woven together. And that's, that's where, as I said, the last few weeks, that's where my head has been. And it's been such a, uh, a nice, nice breath of fresh air to, to, yeah. You know. Yeah. It's almost a mixture of meditation and playing your violin. That's a great that's word for it. Yeah, it is, it is, it is very uh, meditative. Are there any practice tips you would give people specific to bluegrass or some of these um, improvisation based American styles you play like Texas contest swing, Western swing and, or bluegrass? Yeah, I think that the, the best practice technique I can uh, recommend to anybody is to just shut up and listen. And if you're, if you're, for example, for me, uh, as, as you said earlier, you know, some of the first music that you had heard that I participated in was bluegrass music. Uh, which, which is really nice to hear because I've never once ever considered myself a bluegrass player. Though I was in a, a pretty progressive bluegrass band, Cadillac Sky, um, I, was, I didn't grow up in that world. I didn't grow up speaking that musical language. But what I did do was listen to tons of recordings from the early stuff with Bill Monroe and Chubby Wise to all the modern stuff with Stuart Duncan and Aubrey Haney and, and O'Connor. Right. And man, the, the vast world of music that is found between and, and, and listening to certain things that were kind of common threads for bluegrass, playing fifths, uh, playing in second position, um, thinking about uh, keys that are common in that genre besides G and A, B is very common. So learning how to play fluidly in the key of B is, that was, probably the biggest hurdle for me. I don't know why my hands just absolutely despise that key and those shapes on the instrument. I don't think they're just your hands, Ross. <laughs> Dude, B sucks <laughs> super hard. <laughs> um, but, but, I, but I listened and it was the same thing when I really got into to Celtic music, like really listening to players like Liz Carroll and Martin Hayes and mm -hmm. Sean Keane with the Chieftains and Fertile Scott Hill, like the old players and the young players and listening to like the, the common threads through the playing, which would be like the triplet bowing and how they would um, express the ornamentations. Mm -hmm. And once I, uh, I, I guess, um, when I started, instead of, as I said earlier, instead of like learning solos verbatim, when I started taking the spirit of a, of a genre or of a, or, or of a player mm -hmm. and applying it to my own uh, music, um, I was able to then focus my practice on the little tiny things like the ornamentations, the slides, the things that make each genre sound like the genre. For example, Cajun playing isn't so much about, I mean, it's tricky left hand, but, but it's all about the bow. And it really is about the bow in most of these genres, but uh, where jazz isn't so much about the bow because it's about the line that you're playing, the improvised thought, and the bow should uh, go with the left hand where Cajun, uh, the, the bow should direct where your fingers are going. So it's like this opposite thing, depending on the genre that we're in. Um, so that's my suggestion for players in practice is, is to listen and listen deeply to inflection and, and detail. It's, you know, I, I assume if you're a painter and you're learning how Van Gogh painted Starry Night, you're going to pay attention to the subtle changes of, of, right. the, of the brush stroke and, yeah. and the blending of color uh, and, the only way to, to, to do it is to attempt it on your own. You know? Great advice. Well, uh, that's all great, Ross. Um, I would love to open up the floor a little bit to questions with a few people who have joined us here. And uh, I'm not accompanying the Facebook live stream, but um, I have someone checking those questions too, if they arise. So if anyone watching has a specific question for Ross um, and or his fiddle playing, <laughs> ask it. Um, <laughs> Or have we covered them all? Maybe we've, we've covered all the burning questions. Well, how did, I have a question for you. How yeah. did you get into fiddling? Well, actually, um, I didn't want to mention this because I didn't want to steal the show. This is about you, but I uh, actually got into fiddling in a similar way. It was my sister. 
Uh, my sister no longer plays, but when she was like four or five years old, she had this obsession with uh, with the fiddle. And I should probably preface this with both my sister and my brother, for that matter, were raised at a music camp, the Swannanoa Gathering in Asheville. Oh, America. man. I've heard, I've never been, but I've heard that it's just magical. Uh, we'll have to get you when, you know, when, when, when we can have music camps again. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so my dad is... The, the founder and director of that. He's been doing that to this. No way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I know I like, I struck gold. I got the winning lottery fiddle ticket. And I, I got yeah, to grow up yeah. there and be exposed to lots of different kinds of music. But, uh, and so my sister was of course too. And she got really interested in the fiddle, would cry herself to sleep every night. Oh, I want to play the fiddle. I want to play the fiddle. Um, and, you know, my parents, they finally caved and they, they rented a month's worth of fiddle lessons and fiddle rental for her or violin at the time, you know. They didn't know what genre she was going to play. And I, I went to the lesson. Ten minutes into the lesson, she turns to my mom. She's like, I don't want to do this anymore. And my mom is like, hold up, hold up. We've already invested this money. It's like, you can't walk away that easy. So they were like, well, hey, Finn, do you want to, we'll just swap it out for a three-quarter size and you can do the month's worth of lessons. And same thing, man, I just, I went home, I did like a week's worth of homework in the first three hours. And yeah. I, I was just enamored. Um, originally with Irish music, because uh, that's what my parents play. So that's what I heard in the house all the time. Um, but later, all sorts of styles of music because of the Swan and Gathering. So I would learn old time music at old time week and bluegrass music at fiddle week and, or, you know, whatever it was. But Irish music was like my first musical language. How did you find then when when starting because that obviously starting out uh, with with Irish music is vastly different than Texas contest style playing. D I mean specifically like, like bowing. Yeah. Um, how how was it? I know my experience going from like longbow playing to the short like very articulate Irish playing was an experience for you going from Irish music to the other genres, uh, the Brazilian music, the shore music, and the bluegrass music. All these genres. How did you find? Uh, your progress and your development in these different genres uh yeah so the rules have switched here um so in the beginning uh i definitely had a quote-unquote irish accent in my yeah. in my playing you know it was just kind of unavoidable just because that was the music that i was listening to um the first non-irish music that i fell in love with was uh swing music and that was when i was 14 i got a tape of stefan grappelli and, and jenga reinhardt and yeah. um, so I started transcribing Grappelli solos with no clue of like chord theory. I could play these solos, but ask me to take a solo on that tune and I'd be lost. Um, but uh, that's, that's when I first started to like learn about other Boeing vocabulary. And, and like you, I did a lot of listening. So I, it wasn't as much a conscious thing as like, oh, I'm gonna slur all these notes together. I would just reproduce it because that's what I would hear people doing. Um, with, with some genres, I had to be a little more conscious of Boeing's and that kind of thing than others. Uh, you mentioned Brazilian music. Uh, Brazilian music was like the most different of anything I'd ever tried. So I had to be very aware of of Boeing's and, and all these little techniques. In that case, because violin doesn't really exist in Brazilian music. So you're pretty much always imitating other instruments, uh, either the, the mandolin which they call a bandolin there, but it's the same instrument. Um, or wind instruments, like the clarinet, saxophone. And um, so, yeah, I think a lot, of, a lot of these things, to give the fiddlers out there hope, I think a lot of these things just come naturally the more you listen. It's like a language. You immerse yourself in it, and you just start to reproduce certain things without, without being aware that you're doing it. But it's just that constant exposure, which which allows the music to inevitably creep into your playing, you know? Um, so yeah, the, uh, it's, I, I'm, I'm always trying to like mimic anything I hear. I, I like to do dialects and accents and, you know, that kind of thing. I'm just, I'm, uh, I'm probably insufferable at parties because I just want to <laughs> put impressions and stuff like that. Well, you have such a beautiful fluid style of, of playing. You, you, and I, I don't say this in, in a, in a, condescending way to to any any player out there that's listening but you can tell immediately within the first few few seconds of hearing a player if they just have that that thing 
they have that natural deal. And I, and I say natural because I guess a couple of weeks back I watched the, uh, the baseball movie, the natural. Okay. And, and some people just get a thing so for some folks. It's, it's science, math, history, engineering, whatever it might be, whatever their field of interest. Um, and, and not that players that don't have that, um, natural inclination can't rise through the ranks and, and surpass everybody. They certainly can, but you very much like have that. And the first time I heard you play, I was like, wow, this, this cat's got it. Like that was a thing that he didn't, he, he was born with that vibe. Um, and, you know, probably a combination of nature and nurture uh, for the, the environment that you grew up in. You know? well, well, first of all, thank you so much. I, that means a lot coming from you because I, I respect you as a fiddle player and as a musician. Um, and just to comment on that, I will say um, it's amazing how much of a difference that practice <laughs> can make. Because I, you know, just being in quarantine, a um, little different from what you told me. I, I've actually been practicing a lot and um, wake up kind of inspired to play every day. I don't know where that awesome. comes from, but, um, but I've been working, I've been working very deliberately on certain things and I've been noticing improvements in areas that, uh, I'm like, wow, I've been playing 20 plus years and I've, it's just now that I'm figuring that out. But the, the point is like, I'm aware and I'm, I'm, I'm making improvements and th obviously this has been happening for 20 years. It's not just now. Uh, but I've been improving as a player, I would hope. But um, it's it's amazing to see, like I listen to recordings of myself from when I'm a teenager. And I'm like, if I, 33 year old Finn, met this kid now, I don't know if I would have had the same impression that you just mentioned. If I would have, it, it, to me, it would have been a toss up. Be like, is this kid gonna, you know, become a professional fiddler? Like, I don't know. You know, I listened to those recordings and, and I, of course I'm like projecting I was that kid, so I know what that kid was like, and I'm like, oh, that I hear a bit of ego in that playing, or like, uh, you know, he's he clearly hasn't learned this part of music yet. Um, and just to make the point that like, no matter what you're born with, what whatever your innate talent is, you know, your progress is really limitless. You can really exactly. Um, and I've I've met so many players over the years where I turn my head and I'm like, what? I have to tell you a story because um, he's a friend of ours, Tyler Andall. Um, so I've known Tyler Andall probably since he was 10 years old. Yeah. And he's a few years younger than me, but uh, we met at the Swan Noah Gathering. He came for, he actually came for Celtic Week because at the time he wasn't sure which genre he was going to play, which is, if you know Tyler or know about him, he's this amazing virtuoso American style fiddle player, plays all sorts of styles. Um, and that's what he's known for. But at the time, it was kind of up for grabs. So he came to Celtic Week and he came to Old Time Week. And he ended up liking old time music more. Surprise, surprise, uh, if you've heard him. But, uh, but two years later, he came back. And Roz, he was another fiddle player. Like, I didn't recognize him. Oh, yeah. And I think he had, in that, in that period of time, he had started studying with Casey Dreesen, which yeah. had a lot to do with that. So he, his chopping was amazing. And, but I was like, wow. Like, I can't remember the last time I heard someone improve that fast over that short a period of time. You know, and Tyler was a teenager. It's not like he was six. People think you have to start violin, like, you know, when you're three or four or something. Um, no, you can, I started when I was 10. So, um, but you can start when you're a teenager and still make lots of improvement. So I think that should, hopefully fiddlers will find solace with that, you know, and be inspired to play. <laughs> Totally, and, and that's just it. The, the beautiful thing about this this instrument, uh, you know, a piano, you have 88 keys, and you press them, and they make a sound, and that's that. Yeah. And there, there are subtle things to do with the instrument, but it is limited because it is built that way. Right. Uh, the, the violin, man, I just, I know that, it, that we both have a, a, an extreme bias towards the instrument, but... It's one of the few instruments to me that really is limitless. The number of genres that uh, the violin is found in probably supersedes even the guitar as far as like common world inst instruments found around the world. Right. Uh, and be because it's limitless, the opportunity to grow and improve and learn is just, uh, well, it, it's those points themselves are limitless. And yeah. it's, a life, it's a lifelong quest. And... I mean, really, at the end of the day, what is, what does it mean to be good? What does it mean to be exceptional? That's just 
subjective. It's a matter of opinion because when I was younger, I was so impressed by the musicians that had this technical prowess that just floored me. But now in my mid thirties, I find the greatest joy listening to players sit under a tree playing old time melodies that yeah. are simple, but honest. Right. Uh, and, I, and I'm so attracted to that. I never thought I would be. I love hearing a bit of sloppy playing. I love a bit of funky intonation. I, I love hearing a bit of scratch because that's real life. Those are the, the bruises and the scars that we all carry just yeah. put in sound form yeah. uh, and nobody's perfect. And that's, um, I don't know. I think that's, that has been a great thing uh, to, that, that I've had to teach myself. Uh, uh, and I guess as a reminder frequently that uh, this, this whole idea of, of perfection and, and, you know, ascending whatever, fucking mountains out there it's just it's it's silliness and uh it's it's all about the the heart and intent you put into it no matter your level of ability absolutely yeah i i agree with you on that well spoken ross well uh so, someone already had to leave where i realized we we're just a little bit over the 30 minutes but you know that's kind of oh great. keep going man i got all the time in the world <laughs> <laughs> well one thing i did want to ask you before before we close here is um what are some projects you're working on now? I mean, you just released this single, but what are some other, I know that there's like COVID and a lot of stuff is frozen at the moment, but um, if, if there are a few things you can tell folks about maybe uh, sites or projects they're involved with. Yeah, I mean, of course, you know, people can find me on, on Facebook or Instagram. I have a Twitter, but I don't ever tweet. It's just a thing. I don't do TikTok because I can't dance to save my life. Uh, and my website is uh, just a homespun little thing on Squarespace. So it's not really impressive, but it does have What's information. That? Huh? What's the website? Oh, it's just rossholmes.net. I wasn't cool enough or fast enough to claim .com. So I'm, I'm one of those .netters. <laughs> Ross Holmes. We must find him and destroy him. Man, so apparently rossholmes.com is a, a lawyer down in New Zealand. And actually, it's really funny, man. I Years ago, maybe in, God, maybe 2000 seven or eight back in MySpace days, I received a message from a dude named Ross Holmes, who is a wedding singer somewhere on like the Outer Banks. <laughs> so, oh, wow. <laughs> maybe Myrtle Beach or someplace. This old, older dude who is just this total Frank Sinatra crooner type cat and uh, <laughs> sent me a message and he was like, you know, there are very few Ross Holmeses out there and it's nice to know that there's another musician, Ross Holmes. And, well, <laughs> anyway, he, he I've got the- drive his fans to you and you drive your fans to him. I mean, <laughs> Um, yeah, so I mean, people can find me online, but I'm really excited. That, so Overture is the, um, the, the, the solo violin prologue to the American Fiddle Suite, which is a work that I've been composing with um, a, a dear friend and insanely gifted, brilliant composer in Washington, D.C., Aaron Malone. Mm -hmm. um, you, at some point in time, I'm sure you, Finn, have come across Aaron in either the bluegrass world or the jazz world or the the folk scene uh, in, in some, at some point in time, because he's, he's played with loads of folks. But um, the American Fiddle Suite is a, is a 13 movement work for, for solo fiddle and orchestra. And it's been really interesting to write this piece. For, for several years now, I've been dropping little uh, Easter eggs on Instagram. Mm -hmm. uh, little snippets of melodies that are fiddle-ish. Uh, some a few people have messaged since Overture came out and said, "Hey, I recognize this moment from being this clip in this Instagram post that you put out." Little do they know. Now it's I guess I'm blowing the cover, but <laughs> so many of these little themes that I have shared on Instagram were intentionally part of Overture, mm -hmm. which are wholly part of the American Fiddle Suite. Wow. Um, and I'm really excited about this work because it incorporates elements that aren't common in the classical idiom. So there are chunks of this fully orchestrated work uh, that are left wide open for the soloist to improvise over. Or moments where uh, the soloist has to provide chop accompaniment with the orchestra, which will be a challenge for a lot of players that don't have that particular technique down right. but want to perform the piece. So it's really opening up um, the opportunity for players to uh, my, myself at the top of the list to, to improve and and get better at speaking these these languages in a different setting other than a band doing it with an orchestra is like this 
really intense jam session. And um, yeah, uh, so I'm I'm super stoked about that. That's down the road. And with with the the COVID shutdowns, you know, most orchestras have well, I would suspect all of them now have canceled their 2020 2021 season. Has pushed everything back. So our hope was to have this out by uh, and out to perform by 2021. But the reality is it'll be 2022 or 23 by the time this gets programmed in with the orchestras, which is fine. There's no, there's no rush with it. And it actually allows the other projects that I have uh, in the works um, to sort of take flight as well. I, I have a, um, a really cool old time project that I'm doing with uh, Jeff Picker who plays bass with the Ricky Skaggs uh, and a, a DJ, Daniel Saltz, who uh, does all the sampling and programming for Lauren and Daigle. Uh, we have this like fusion electronic old time project that we've written and are in the process of recording. Um, I have another kind of Celtic inspired album that I've started work on uh, with a guitar player, Fanon Debara. Yeah. Um, and uh, a, th a, a lyrical album that I've got about nine tracks done for. Um, lyrics have, uh, lyrical writing has always been a very, um, behind the curtain thing that I've I've done for years but people haven't known as part of my scene uh but then to not only write the tunes but to to sing them as well and and record most of the instruments on this recording has been a um on this album has been uh for more than anything an exercise for me uh, just another thing to pursue um because I've wanted to do that yeah I'm not I'm not launching into a, a career as a uh as a um as a singer fronting a band and, you know, headlining big festivals. It's not, it's not my interest, but it's, it is enough of an interest where I, I've had to do this recording for my, for my own sake. Yeah. Um, so there's just, there's a lot of stuff kind of always uh, in, in the, in the works, you know, it's just kind of never ends. And then you've got when life is back to normal, you know, touring with the dirt band and sessions here in Nashville and just various projects with people. I mean, I, what it really comes down to, Finn, is the fact that I love people and I love making music with people and for people yeah. and any opportunity to do it with friends or people that I've never met. Uh, it's but You really do. I, I mean, do it. You, uh, you're a shining example of, of the importance of community and building a community. Uh, I mean, I don't know if anyone watching follows Ross on Instagram or Facebook, but he's always posting. He's super active. Um, you actually like, I, I look at your posts and I'm, and I see you on Facebook and I'm like, I guess it's time to post something, Finn. It's like, Ross <laughs> is killing it. And like, I'm such a curmudgeon when it comes to social media in general. Just, yeah. Oh, it's so fake and vain and all this. Um, but it's important too. And I think there's a way to do it right. And I think you do it right. Well, um, well thank you. I, I certainly, there are people out there that have, I mean, an exponential amount more followers than, than, than I do. Uh, but it's not about it. That to me, I mean, um, one thing that's been really important for my soul has been connecting with folks around the world, but I, I'm sure people hit you up all the time for, for lessons. And um, it's something for me, I, I don't, I, I love teaching. I love teaching people that are kind of at like a certain level because it's easier to communicate with folks that already have a grasp on the fundamentals of playing. But right. um, man, it, it's kind of been a thing for a long time, but especially during these days, uh, just, you know, giving, Anybody who messages, man, I, I, I hope that they feel uh, my, my appreciation for their message and that I'm giving them the time of day, um, not just by communicating, but by offering a, a 30 minute lesson, 45 minute lesson. I, I never charge people for it. I just, I wanna be accessible to, to folks because there have been musicians that have been accessible to me. Uh, yeah, and that's, there's a responsibility that I, that I feel personally to, to be available to musicians, I didn't have that opportunity. I didn't grow up in a family of musicians, people whose job it was to make music. My mom was a nurse and, and my, my dad was a pilot and, and has worked for an uh, electronics company for years. And um, so I didn't, my sister and I didn't have that sort of leg up that uh, like my kids will have if they choose to go into music because that's my field as well. Mm -hmm. um, for folks that, uh, I don't know. I just, I, I, I love giving and I, I love giving my time that way. And it's, man, selfishly, uh, it has benefited me wholly because I've just made friends around the planet, Absolutely. you know, people in Iraq and, and India and China and yeah. Lagos, Nigeria. And man, it's like, God, it's so amazing that 
this wasn't available 10 years ago. The, the accessibility of communication and information and sharing just wasn't around like it is now. And um, to me, that's, that's the impetus, my impetus for, for posting and sharing is just to keep an open conduit to other players and to be a source of, uh, you know, just, just a resource for people. Um, because there, as I said, there have been musicians that have been that for me and I'm grateful for it. You know? I, yeah, I think that's beautifully spoken, Ross, and uh, I couldn't agree more. Honestly, yeah, I mean, I, 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 there's not really a lot, a lot else to say. I think you pretty much said it all. So, uh, <laughs> God, so long-winded. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's great. It's great. I mean, uh, I think everyone here, they're obviously still here, which I think is telling. They could have left. They could have left. Oh, this is going on too long. No, um, no, but I think that's a, that's a good stopping place. Um, and uh, I appreciate you taking your time to chat with me about this and to be the inaugural uh, musician in I'm calling it musician's workbench um, I almost called it fiddler's workbench because pretty much everyone I've asked up until now is a fiddler but that might change we'll see um, well I'm, I'm sure it will and man I, I really appreciate you investing your time into creating a platform like this for for players to have for you to have a discussion with players but for for players to to meet and learn from each other um, you know, there was a time when all when the Corona days started, where every, where the online streaming scene was so saturated with performances and people scrambling to uh, make up for lost gigs, and and of course that was to be expected. But then the reality was, after about a month in, it kind of fizzled, and right. everybody just got burnt out by the online onslaught. Um, but now I think we're seeing people return to this, these forms of communication and opportunities to converse about, um, about music and, and really just ha having a place to go where, yeah, we can talk about fiddling, but what can we do to lift each other's spirits and what can we do to participate right. responsibly uh, from a distance uh, and, and to lift each other up? Because more than anything, the mental side of this, this time is uh, utterly challenging for most all of us in our own way. And I, I think it's critical to uh, to just be available. And you're providing an amazing resource for people following, and uh, an amazing opportunity to engage your friends, man, your peers. And yeah, well, congratulations for for this inaugural one, man. Little thing. I don't deserve too much praise. It's just it's a small thing in a big pool of uh, options, and live streams, and things out there. But uh, but I would just hope that you know people do do see the the value in it if if that's nothing else just improved mental health like you're saying that's you know yep. something to be aware of so uh for those that are interested the next uh the next musician's workbench interview will be two weeks from today on friday the 31st july 31st with bronwyn keith hines oh man god she's so good oh <laughs> so good. <laughs> so kills good. Me. talk about an amazing young player holy smokes she just gets better she's another one so every time you see her like damn yeah, I know. Right. God. Yeah. I first heard her probably four or five years ago. I was like, whoa, watch out, man. She's something else. And now it's just like, dude, just stop improving. You're crushing us all. <laughs> she posts these things on Instagram, you know, like these Bobby Hicks licks, perfect double stops, perfect intonation up the neck. And I'm like, you can't hide that. I mean, that's not edited. You know, it's just, it's beautiful. So yeah, if anyone is interested, a Bronwyn is a bluegrass player. Uh, she plays other things too but she's um bluegrass is probably how she most identifies herself so uh tune in two weeks from today on july 31st and uh i look forward to seeing everyone that chooses to come and ross thank you so much for your time and i'm honored thank you so much this has been a wonderful conversation man likewise man it's been great yeah you know? we got to figure out another col collaboration too man snarky puppy was was super hit but we got to do something else for the people i 100 percent agree let's do it man let's do it I'll, I'll be dming you later perfect i love it hey man thank you so much and thanks everybody who tuned in for watching i see some some family members here on the zoom call that, that i love all right totally cool. yeah. cheers Ross. take care man yeah. see you guys bye-bye